السلام عليكم الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمدا رسول الله اشهد ان محمدا رسول الله حي على الصلاه حي على الصلاه حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا Certainly, absolutely, unquestionably, the perfect praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His aid, we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls, our own bad deeds. Whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whosoever Allah leads astray. No one can guide and bear witness that there is no God, no deity, nothing worthy of worship except Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. This dua that I say after this salutation is from Moses, or Musa alayhi salam, before he was about to approach the Pharaoh. And I feel a need for it today. And he says to his Lord, Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, wa ya Sadli Amri, wafla tu ufla tami lisani yet karu kawi. Oh my Lord, expand my chest for me, make my task easy for me, remove the impediment from my, my tongue so they may understand what I say. Allah tells us in the Quran, Audu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Kitabun and Allahu Ilaika Litfuj Ejanasa Minna Bulemati Ila Nuri Bi Ikni Rabbihim Ila Sarout Al Azizu Hamid. This, this Quran is a book that we have revealed to you, meaning revealed to the Prophet, so that you may lead people out of darknesses into the light. Al-Nur, by the will of your Lord, to the path of the Almighty and the praiseworthy. So we thank Allah Azza wa Jal for the Quran. We thank Allah for the light. We thank Allah for showing us the light out of the darknesses. We thank Allah for this day of Juma. We thank Allah for waking us for the best day of the week. We thank Allah for another opportunity, another breath to show our gratitude to him for making us Muslim. It is indeed a mercy and a blessing from Allah al haqq the impartial judge, the arbitrator, the giver of justice. His justice, once rendered, cannot be stopped. He always delivers justly in every situation and never makes a mistake. He is the best of judges. So we pray and we strive so that perhaps others are guided to this mercy and this blessing called Al-Islam. Allah tells us, tells the believers, the Muslims, the 
movement to reflect, to consider, to think, to use our brains, not just be blind followers, not just blind followers of me, but reflect and think. We accept Al-Islam because we were convinced of it. It makes sense to us. How can you make a decision between two things? One of them has to make more sense than the other. Today is a time for thinking. This khutbah is a time for thinking and using your intellect, your aql, using the elm, the knowledge that you have acquired throughout your life to come to a conclusion. Now you don't have to come to the conclusion about this particular subject today, but I want you to at least consider the information, and reflect and ponder on it. We as Muslims follow the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the words of Allah Azza wa Jal and the life of Muhammad the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Warfin Muhammad would say the Uswa, the example of the Prophet, not the Sunnah, because the Quran actually does not say the Sunnah of the Prophet. It says the Sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal, saying his way, his pattern, his way, the sunnah of Allah, never changes. It is always the same at every time, right? But not particularly about the prophet's sunnah. But Allah tells us to use the uswa, the example of Muhammad the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And we say the sunnah. We find this sunnah, this way in the hadith. Hadith means a story or a narration or a message that is revealed. There's a, in the Quran, it talks about the hadith of Moses, or the hadith of, hadith of Ibrahim, the hadith of Yusuf, the story, the narrative, the message of these prophets, the things that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the things he said, the things he did, and the things that he allowed around him. See, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was obligated it was mandatory for him to correct any wrong that was done in his presence. So his sunnah is also what happened around him that he did not correct, meaning he allowed it to happen. So if a brother wore a turban that was cocked to the side and he didn't correct it, then it's allowed, it's permissible to do. Allah tells us in the Quran, the best hadith, Allahu anzalna has, hasanal hadith, the best hadith is the Quran. What he has sent down is the best hadith. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the walking Quran. So what he said and what he did and what he allowed is the Quran in action. This is what the sunnah, the uswa, the example, and the hadith is and why it is so important for us. This is how we pray because our standing and bowing and the words that we say in between time are not explicitly written in the Quran, but they are in the Hadith. Allah tells us in the Quran to give zakat, but it doesn't say how much to give. We find that in the Hadith. To perform the Hajj, you can't find that in the Quran. To perform Umrah, you cannot find that in the Quran, only in the Hadith. To perform weddings and funerals, those rituals and the acts that were done and how they are performed are in the Hadith. So with that said, the first thing I want to say to you all is no reasonable Muslim, and I say reasonable Muslim, accepts all hadith to be authentic. We have sahih hadith, which means they are authentic, they are authentic. We have the hasan, meaning they are good and fair, and the da'i, meaning that they are weak. And there is a rigorous process to determine which are authentic and which are good and which are weak. So the ones that are good, they have some broken chain in them. Somebody lied at one point in their life, right? But in order to be authentic and sahih, nobody in that chain has ever lied, as long as they have been Muslim. And they check and cross-check with other people to determine that this hadith is authentic. And the hadith, most importantly, most importantly, has to be in line and sync with the Quran. 
So, the first thing a Muslim should do, the first thing a Muslim should do is familiarize themselves with the Quran. Not Hadith. There are several Muslims who can quote every Hadith in the book, but they can't quote the Quran. That's a problem. Huge problem. Right? The Quran is the measuring stick. It calls itself the Quran, meaning the criteria, where you judge right from wrong. It is also called the Muhaim, meaning quality control. Why do you need quality and control? Because some things can creep into the religion and cause confusion. So you need a measuring stick to determine which one is true and which one is false. Me being a student of comparative religion, I know this firsthand. Lucky for us, we have the Quran. We have the measuring stick that is unchanged, unadulterated, and it can validate everything else, including the Hadith. What do you do when somebody questions something in the Hadith? Or go to the Quran. Because it's supposed to be, the Hadith is supposed to be the Quran in action. In action. Now, now here is the problem. Not all Sahih Hadith are authentic. They're not all reliable, even though they say they are. This may seem controversial to some people. I don't mean to be. I only mean to stand here in the station of Muhammad the Prophet, who was the most truthful person on earth, to tell you the truth. I'll give you an easy, easy example. The Dajjal, the Antichrist. What does he look like? I remember as a child I read in the Hadith about the Antichrist, the Dajjal, and it said he had one eye. And I thought to myself, as a child, you think of Cyclops, you know, that monster with one eye. And I was thinking, why would anybody ever follow somebody with one eye anyway? I would never listen to somebody who has one eye in the middle of their head, right? But the more I studied, the more I researched, I realized that it was more to it than that. I read more about him and it, found, it turned out that he had both eyes, but one of them was damaged. One of them was actually protruding from the socket. So it didn't work, but he had two eyes, he didn't just have one eye in the middle. Now the question is, I want you to ask yourselves, because you can't answer out loud, because only I can talk uh, during the cookbook. The question is, which eye was blind? The left eye? or the writer, because there are multiple sahih, authentic hadith that say he was blind in his right eye, and multiple hadith, sahih hadith, that say he was blind in his left eye, or he will be. Which one is it? Someone is wrong. I'm not saying anyone is lying, but someone has to be wrong. When you have multiple choice, someone is wrong, and the reader can make the decision which one they choose. Or they can go to the Quran to find out which one is right. Anybody know what's the problem with that? Hadith or the Quran in motion, right? Well, what does the Quran say about which eye will it be? The Quran does not say a single word about which eye it would be. In fact, the Quran doesn't say about a word about the Dajil at all, the Antichrist, not at all. So why are we going through all this? All right? I just want you to think, to reflect, to have discernment, to use your mind, think. Right? Allah tells us repeatedly to think and reflect. Never let anyone tell you to follow something bluntly. I'm telling you, you follow what I'm saying. Look up the hadith for yourself. Look in the Quran. Look in the index and see if there's a word called Dajil or Antichrist. See whether it says left eye, right eye. It does not. Not a word about it. Allah. So I'm going to leave that here. Hold that in your mind. Allah tells us in the Quran, or it is translated, do not, do you not see that Allah glorified, that Allah is glorified by all those in the heavens and the earth, even the birds, when they soar? each distinct, instinctively knowing their manner of prayer and supplication. And Allah has perfect knowledge of all that they do. So everything in the heavens and the earth, 
have their manner of prayer and glorification. The birds and the bees pray. They make salat. That's the word that is used, salat. They pray and they glorify Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah also says, the seven heavens and the earth and all those in, the, in them glorify him. There is not a single thing that does not glorify his praise. But you cannot comprehend their glorification. You can't understand how they glorify Allah. And it says, indeed, he is the forbearing, the all forgiving. So everything on the earth and in heaven praises Allah. But we can't understand how. Have you ever listened to birds chirp in the morning? Five in the morning, you listen to them. Sounds like music, doesn't it? This entire universe is music, is rhythm. Our heartbeat is the rhythm of our lives. When it starts, we stop. When it stops, we stop. So the birds and the bees all singing the praises of their Lord. Everything in motion has a frequency, a sound, and a rhythm. Even the blood pumping through our veins is making music, though we can't hear it. The earth and the planets in orbit and the grass as it grows. Just because we can't hear it does not mean that it is not glorifying its Lord. Yet, there are hadith that say music is for us. Remember when I told you to hold in your head? Music, musical instruments is Quran. Some hadith that say singing is Quran. When your heart is a musical instrument, when the muadhin's vocal cords are a musical instrument. But let me tell you about some of these hadith and what they say because I want this to resonate with you because it is very important. And all of our brothers and sisters, all the believers on earth who believe this, I want you to understand why they do. The hadith that say the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, made haram. Liquor, gambling, drums, and the tambourine. And it says in this hadith, and every intoxicant is haram. So a drum and a tambourine is classified categorized and as an intoxicant. In another hadith, it says the Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prohib prohibited beating of the drums and the sound of flutes. Flutes are haram. In another hadith, he says beating drums and playing the harp and blowing the flute are haram. In another hadith, it says that our prophet Muhammad says, most certainly there will be in the ummah people who will make lawful fornication, silk, silk clothes, liquor, and musical instruments. In another hadith, it says, the messenger of Allah says, when my ummah indulges in 15 misdeeds, calamity will ensue. Among them are singing girls and musical instruments. So I want you to understand, this is where our brothers and sisters Get this from. This is why it's so serious, why it's so important. Because they can't consider that that may not be true because it says sahib underneath that hadith. So it must be true. Somebody went through some rigorous process to find out. Even though that rigorous process also says that Daljil has a left eye or a right eye. So consider the implications. How serious these words are, and let us beg Allah as a wajal to always, always bring us closer to the truth. Let us stop now and ask Allah for forgiveness. The perfect praise belongs to Allah, the guardian evolver of all systems of knowledge. 
May Allah's blessings and peace be bestowed upon our noble leader Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his family, upon his companions, upon his followers, all of us, all together, all over this world. Even those who listen to me now think I don't know what I'm talking about. Right? We have an example in the Quran of the children of Israel making unlawful what Allah did not make unlawful. This is why they have such an extensive dietary restriction. Allah as a wajal says in the Quran that they made up many of the rules that they had. So Allah held them accountable for the laws that they made up. We as believers are supposed to learn from their mistakes, not repeat them. So how do you think they made those mistakes? Somebody, perhaps with good intention, said you shouldn't do that. People wouldn't stop, so they said, Moses said, you shouldn't do that. And enough people heard it, and it circulated, and it became accepted, even though it was not corroborated by the real Torah of Allah as a wajib, and what really Moses had, be, had been given the revelation for. And that's what the Bible is. It is an unauthorized da'if, or weak hadith of the prophets. It has no transmission. It has no true transmission from one to the next to determine whether this is true or not. They don't even know who the authors are. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, for every prophet, every prophet, that means Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are enemies, devilish humans and jinn, inspiring one another with elegant words of deception. This is what Allah says. So are we following the words of our prophet or the words of deception? The African-American and the African have in their heart and in their culture a special place for music. To, prohi to prohibit music is to prohibit the African and the African-American. If you say we can't play music, we ain't coming. Mm -hmm. And that means even to this day. So perhaps someone said this in an effort to make sure we don't come. We use music and drums for communication, <clears throat> for connectivity, for our own freedom. There were slave revolts that were coordinated by drums. The African and the African American will never, never erase this from their hearts. And they shouldn't. El Islam does not does not erase culture, even if some people voluntarily erase their own culture. The large majority will never, never erase their heritage and culture, and they should not. As it pertains to drums, there are scientists who find out that there are health benefits to drums. The act of drumming itself brings, brings or releases endorphins that reduce stress and promote stress and promotes sense of well-being. Repetitive drumming calms your mind, similar to meditation. Drumming has been found to improve your coordination, boost your immune system, and enhance your cognitive functions. The African drum rhythms promote overall health and well-being. You may not know this, but there's a such thing as Arabic music. On the music scale, when you listen to music, and it goes the, the frequency, there are two forms of Arabic um, scales for music. Look up if you want to at any time, Arabic instruments. There are tons and tons of them. The lutes, the flutes, the drums, over 20 different kinds of drums. Look up Muslim Spain, you'll find a multitude of musical instruments. Music is everywhere. It's Indian music and Pakistani music and everywhere, and on and on and on. It is the majority of musical instruments that came from Europe got their roots from Arabic musical instruments. The guitar, the bass drum, the violin was all something Muslims had done previously. The modern guitar actually gets its name from the Moorish guitar. It was called Guitara Muriska. We just toned it down to guitar. 
So many Muslims from the Middle East are erasing their own culture and heritage. But are they really? You get in that car, you might not think that they are erasing that musical culture. <laughs> and there are prominent scholars that we look up to, that we love, who accepted music as halal. Al-Kindi, he was an Arab, a Muslim polymath, he was a philosopher, also a musical theorist. He was considered the father of Arab philosophy. A man named Abu Fajar also was a, a writer, a historian, a genealogist, a poet, and a musicologist, and a scribe. And he was of Arab, Quraysh origin. A man named al Faridi was also a philosopher, early Islamic philosopher and a music theologian, or music theorist. And he is known as the founder of Islamic political philosophy. And Imam al-Ghazali, his own position is that music in itself is permissible, though in certain circumstances it is unlawful and undesirable. So where did they get this idea, these Muslim scholars, where did they get this idea that music was allowed when everyone says it's haram? Well, as I said before about the Dajjal, the Antichrist, and his left eye, right eye, look in the Quran, you won't find anything about music. In the Quran, what they use is a thing that is, means idle talk, not music. Well, it doesn't say a word about music or about singing. So let's see what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Right? We heard what he said, he said you shouldn't be listening to music, right? Then it says Aisha, or Ibn Abbas reported that Aisha gave away one of her relatives in marriage. And they were among the Ansars, meaning they were in Medina, they were Muslims, they were the people who helped the Muslims when they came to Medina. And the prophet said, did you send someone to sing, to sing at the funeral? And she said, no. Well, she said, he said, you know the Ansars are lovers of poetry, so you should send someone to sing at the funeral, at the wedding, I'm sorry, right? And this is Hassan hadith, meaning it's good. But then there's another Sahih hadith, which collaborates, another authentic hadith. It says, I had a girl of Ansar who was given in marriage, and the messenger of Allah said, why didn't you send somebody to sing? No, in fact, she says, the hadith says, why didn't you sing? He told his wife to go sing at the wedding. That's what hadith says. There's another hadith that says the prophet was passing by a part of, of Medina, and he saw some girls beating drums and singing. And they said, we are the people of Banu Najm. What an excellent neighbor is Muhammad the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They didn't even know that was in his mix. And he says, Allah knows best that you are dear to me. It is his sunnah. He has to correct you if you're doing something wrong. So they were singing and beating drums. And he said, you're near to me. That's what he said to me. He praised them. And he, and he did not. So that means... Playing drums and singing is allowed. In another hadith, it says the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came, came to an apartment while there were two girls singing the song of the Battle of Bu'ed. So the Battle of Bu'ed is the two different tribes in Medina. They fought incessantly all the time. And then they finally had the truth. So they had, in their culture, and just in their city as well, right? So this is not a whole other country. <laughs> so the prophet is born and raised in, in Mecca. He goes to Medina. In Medina, they have their own culture where they celebrate them coming together after this battle. So while these two girls are singing about this battle, Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, comes and scolds the girls because they're also playing musical instruments, wind instruments. And he says, oh, this musical instrument of the devil in the house of the messenger of Allah. And the messenger of Allah turns to him and says, leave them alone. And then he becomes unattentive and hinted, them and hinted at them. And it was on the Eid day. So this was happening on the Eid day. And it said there were also, also Ethiopians playing with shields and spears. And Umar, another one of the Sahaba, came to the Ethiopians and said, stop playing in the masjid. Umar rebuked them. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, leave them alone, O Umar. They are from the Banu Afida. 
the Benu Afida are the tribe from Abyssinia. The king of Abyssinia sent them to be protectors and guides and to follow Muhammad the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So they were guests in their house. And they were playing in the masjid while music was being played and the Prophet both times did not rebuke the people playing the music or the people playing in the masjid. He rebuked the people who tried to rebuke them, who were Sahaba. Abu Bakr and Umar are some of the greatest Sahaba that we have. They are the four rights of they are of the four righteous Khalifa. So he rebuked them instead of rebuking the people who were playing music. In another instance, while in Medina on the day of Ashura, this is New Year's, the tenth day of the New Year's. Again, there was girls beating drums and playing music. As Africans, we beat, beat, beat drums and play music all the time when we celebrate. And we ain't gonna stop, right? So they again tried to rebuke him. Well, in this instance, actually, they were singing and mentioning the qualities of their forefathers who had fought in the Battle of Badr. So again, this is Muslims. This is not non-Muslims singing and beating drums. They are of the Ansar, so they are already Muslims. They actually fought for Islam. And they're singing and playing drums, and our prophet <laughs> does not say stop. So it is permissible. So what we can get from these stories is that it's permissible to play because the Abyssinians had a habit of dancing and playing. Also, they were doing in the, in the Musala, in the masjid. The prophet told, tells them to carry on. It was a command for them to carry on. So Umar and Abu Bakr says, stop. He said, no, do not stop, continue. So he commanded them to continue on. So it's not her own. Another instance, as I said, Abu Bakr and Umar were also rebuked. They were scolded for what they said to the Abyssinians. And as I say, he told Aisha to sing. There's one hadith that says he told her to send somebody. Then he told her specifically, you go to the wedding and sing. So it is permissible to sing and to play drums. As I said, the only idea where people get that music is haram is from the Quran, which is from Surah 31.6. But it talks about idle talk. It says, among the people, there is one who buys idle talk at the expense of his soul in order to lead people astray from the path of Allah without knowledge. Obviously, obviously that is a sin. Whatever idol talk you do, whatever talk you do, period, whatever music you do, if it's to lead people away from Allah as a wajel, then it's a sin. But if you're leading people, two people, to, if you're leading to Allah as a wajel, then it's not a sin. There's one instance, again, I want you to put your thinking caps on for this one, because this is a this is a real conundrum for some. For people who don't reflect, for people who don't think, people who just take things for what is written because somebody told them to believe this. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says he went out for one expedition and when he came back, expedition is when they went out fighting. When he came back, an Ethiopian girl, Abyssinian women were all over the place, right? She came to him and said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I made a vow that if Allah returns you safely, I will beat the tambourine before you and sing. And the Messenger of Allah Azawajal says, If you have made a vow, then beat it. But if you haven't, then don't. So she started beating the tambourine. And Abu Bakr enters while she is beating it. Then Ali enters while she is beating it. And then Uthman enters while she is beating the tambourine. Then Umar enters, so she puts the tambourine underneath her and sits on it. And this hadith says the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed the devil is afraid of you, O Umar. I was sitting while she beat the tambourine, then Abu Bakr, then Uthman, then Ali, but only when you came did she stop to suggest, this hadith suggests that she was satan or that she was performing a satanic deed in front of him and she just stopped when Umar came. Not the prophet. Not the other Sahaba. This is what I'm saying about thinking of what, what the Hadith say and whether you can accept them as truth, even if they say they are Sahih. Does that make sense? That she can say that she can do this in front of the prophet, and it's fine, but in front of Umar, she can't do it. This is the last point I wanted to convey today. And it was about something that was already said. I'm going to read it to you word for word so I can get this correctly. It said that once Abu Bakr 
came to her on the day of the Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha. They didn't know which one it was. But a prophet was with her, and there were two girls singing with her, singing songs of the Ansar, Muslims, about the day of black. Again, this is the day that they were fighting. And they were commemorating being a tribe again, being whole again. And Abu Bakr was twice said, these are the musical instruments of shaitan. But the prophet said, leave them alone, Abu Bakr, for every nation has an Eid, and this day is our Eid. That last part is very important to me. Because we're about to have a parade and an Eid, a parade and a festival. There are some people who think you can only have two festivals, two Eids. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this. He says, for well, every nation has an Eid, a festival. But our Eid is too. So the Prophet acknowledged Eids of culture and Eids of religion. There are more than two Eids in the world, obviously, more than two festivals in the world. But the only two that are religious obligations are the Eid al Fitr and the Eid al Adha. So we can have a parade or a festival and it still be in accordance with Al Islam and our Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu the moral of this kutbah is use the Quran, use the Quran, use the Quran, use the Quran. Do not make unlawful what Allah has made allowable and lawful. Do not erase your culture based on hadith unless the hadith is based on Quran. If I have said anything that is wrong, it is from me. All the truth is from Allah as a wajah. Peace Allah.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Obligation. You want to do cash app is M is dollar sign M W S A L A A M. Or you can mail it in at 614 West 35th Street, Norfolk, Virginia 23508. Or you can mail it at PO Box 1802, Norfolk, Virginia 23501. I won't be here for uh, Fajr. Uh, me and the brothers gonna leave for North Carolina uh, after this, inshallah. Um, on uh, Friday, there will be an Arabic class at 11 o'clock, and then uh, Brother Aaron is going to do the Ta'loon. Um, so all of those will be going on. There are free uh, snacks in the back. Uh, bean pies are $5. Uh, don't forget the college <coughs> tickets. Also remember that um, Bilal Muhammad is going to have on January, on June, I'm sorry, June 15th, the Juneteenth celebration. So he wants us to come out there. We should come out there, especially for this event. Uh, we have the banner already. I think me and Brother Aaron came last time and a couple other people. Brother uh, Kareem brought his truck, so we want to come out and support him for Juneteenth. And then, um, obviously, July 13th, we're going to have the Muslim American Heritage Festival. Uh, so everybody can come out and uh, enjoy that. Um, I'm going to the Business Summit this week, inshallah. It's uh, actually started already, but I want to be here for this Juma. There's a culture night, and then we're going to have some business uh, uh, the business summit basically. So they have meetings on business and how we can uh, enhance and increase our business. Uh, I have pictures coming from somewhere of the uh, grant that we received for uh, uh, New Africa Marketplace. Right. So we signed the contract, the money is coming through. We, uh, it's going to be I'm awesome. Right. Um, <laughs> also, don't forget to uh, make dua for um, Sister Jackie, Imam Jose, and Imam uh, Asadi's wife. And anybody else that you know that are uh, not doing well, please let me know so we can reach out to them. Um, all of us are ailing in some way. Like I said, most, almost everybody on earth has one problem, one ailment. Other people have multiple, so please make dua for them and let me know if there's any uh, issues, anything that anybody that I don't know about or haven't addressed. Um, oh, uh, Yama is gonna do, um, every third Saturday, we're gonna do a walk. Uh, we haven't decided what time it'll be yet, but we're going to do a walk that's going to be promoting health and well-being. So we want as many people to come out as possible. Obviously, that's going to be du'a or a da'wah, actually, but it's also going to be for our health and well-being. So I'll let you know about the day that happens. So, uh, inshallah, we'll have a good turnout. All right. Question over here. Yes, sir. Where's this event going to be held for Brother Bilal? Oh, that is going to be at um, Diggs Town. It's, I don't know if you were there last, last year. So it's like one block away from that library. Um, so you just really, the parade starts there. You walk there to to uh, the library. It's about a 
couple blocks. I don't think it's, it's less than a mile, probably. Um, but it's, it's good just to have, because he had a fire department and the police department out there, and then he had a band behind him, a band playing, right, playing music. Uh, like we're going to have at this uh, <laughs> festival. And listen, man, people, uh, people got me saying stuff. <laughs> if you have an issue, you can come to me and tell me. Yeah. Anybody can. I'm very approachable. But people talking about me behind my back. Fight, fight. Not even a little bit. That's All right. What day. is that date? Well, uh, yes. What is that date? Uh, the 15th. 15th. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you like that sometimes. Bees like that sometimes, right? <laughs> Well, like, what's the lamb drummer? Drummer. So listen, I have an experience with that, right? right. Because it was E uh -huh. with Brother E. Man, we were. Let me turn this up, yeah. man. Get you yeah. talking about somebody. Talking about somebody, yeah. And I had, we had a drum. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, somebody said something. 